We are in Luke chapter 4 this morning, and uh, Jesus is first in Luke. It's, it's called his inaugural sermon, his first words that uh, he is uh, going to share and to say um, for us, even as uh, we come uh, to uh, this text uh, here this morning. As I was prepping this week, I was reminded um, as um, I've watched what God has been doing in my own heart and in my own story, um, how much um, he is doing uh, right now. And um, he is, um, you know, when I, when I engage the word, um, there are things I feel like um, he begins to share. And even this morning when we look at Christ's words, Uh, today, just how preeminent Christ is in Scripture, how Paul, when he wrote in 1 Corinthians that he resolved to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified, how um, that was uh, Paul's instruction and passion for us. So even as we engage this this morning, it's a beautiful, beautiful text um, that I have actually spoken on before. Um, but uh, maybe, as will be true if I speak on it three years from now, it will uh, be true again, but always something new and always something fresh. But every time um, I get up here, every time you come to worship, um, we come in our week. We come in the story of our week, and every story this week has been different. Every engagement has been different. Um, the things that you have done, the things that you have experienced this week, um, are, um, are, are all different and unique to you, and, and I do that too. And even as we read a chapter that talks about uh, freedom and captivity, I'm reminded um, that uh, that message is for us. And, um, and so even as um, I come, um, this message is for me as well. Now, I think what I'm going to do, although we kind of put this uh, together, I'm actually going to read from Isaiah first, Isaiah 60. Did that come in first? Here, is that the first slide uh, before Luke 4? Yes. So, um, Jesus in Luke is going to quote from Isaiah 61. Not reading Isaiah 61, Jesus will read that for us um, when we get there. But I wanted to give some context to what he is doing with Isaiah 61 by reading the very end of Isaiah 60. This is the prophet of God, Isaiah, in the Old Testament. And Isaiah is a prophet, and he's talking to the people of God. And as he talks to the people of God, um, he says this before before Jesus quotes um, what he is going to be Quoting, and so Isaiah says this to the people of God Although you, people of God, have been forsaken and hated, with no one traveling through, you are forsaken, you are hated. I, God, is going to do something. He's the actor. I will make you the everlasting pride and joy of all the generations. You will drink the milk of nations and be nursed at royal breasts. Then you will know that I, the Lord, am your Savior, your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Instead of bronze, I will bring you gold and silver in place of iron. Instead of wood, I will bring you bronze and iron in the place of stones. I will make peace your governor, and well-being, your ruler. No longer will violence be heard in your land, nor ruin or destruction within your borders, but you will call your walls salvation and your gates praise. The sun will no more be your light by day, nor will the brightness of the moon shine on you. For the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. He is writing this because currently they are in bondage. Currently, this is not their current state. Currently, 
they are in a place of captivity, and you notice, I will, I will, I will. It has a, a future tense to it that he is coming. They are held in bondage. The people of God are held in bondage by captors that are too strong for them. They're held in bondage and in captivity by forces and captors that are too strong for them. They can't overthrow them. They need another sphere of power that will come to them. And that is how Isaiah 60 ends. And now I'm going to read Luke chapter 4 because Jesus is going to read the next bit of... Um, the next bit of, of portion here. Then Jesus returned to Galilee, filled with the Holy Spirit's power. Reports about him spread quickly throughout the whole region. He taught regularly in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. But when he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he's coming back home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures. The scroll of the Isaiah the prophet was handed to him, and he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written. He got the scroll of Isaiah, and he went directly. It's a very intentional sermon. He found in Isaiah what he wanted to read. And it was from Isaiah 6, 61, which begins this way. It's the first verse of Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, and the oppressed will be set free. He rolled up the scroll. He handed it back to the attendant, and he sat down. He preaches a much shorter sermon than I do. Then, as they're all looking around, he began to speak with them. The scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled in your presence or this very day. And I'm going to cut it off there because I want to pick up the rest next week. Jesus reads Isaiah 61. And he sits down. Everybody's looking around at him, and he says, oh, by the way, this Isaiah 61 was just fulfilled in your hearing. That's, I mean, you talk about a mic drop. <laughs> you don't need to go there. Uh, we'll be at that at the end. Um, so back to the Luke passage. We had read prior to uh, Luke's passage here in uh, Luke chapter 4. We had seen that uh, Jesus began, or that Luke 4 began with the temptation of Christ. Jesus has just come from being tempted in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And he, these are the first words of Jesus after that temptation, which for Luke is telling um, the particular uh, story here, um, that the temptation um, has come. Um, and as he has come out of the temptation, um, what did the temptation offer Jesus? It offered Jesus easy answers. The devil took Jesus out to the wilderness, and I think we'll get to that temptation when we head toward Lent. But Jesus heard a lot of false promises from the evil one. He heard a lot of false promises from the devil himself. And he's ready to preach. He's ready to preach after hearing the false promises of the evil one, who, by the way, was offering him glory. He was basically offering Jesus a pathway that wouldn't lead Jesus to the cross. He's offering that. He's heard all of these empty promises, these false promises that the devil has promised, actually even using Scripture. He stands up. And he reads this. And I'm just going to really talk briefly about this because I don't know that there's much I can add to what Jesus really, really said. Because it's so powerful. But one of the things that Jesus is doing, Jesus comes back to his own town. Jesus is 
the Messiah, and he has come. And as he begins his inaugural sermon, as he begins his first sermon, as it were, in the book of Luke, he opens up Isaiah 61, and in doing so, he's actually doing something in the presence, and he, he finalizes that in what he says after he sits down. But in opening up Isaiah 61, and in reading Isaiah 61, and then saying that this has been fulfilled in your hearing, Jesus is actually telling us something about history. He opens up Isaiah 61, and he basically says, I'm part of history. I'm included in this history. I'm included in the Old Testament, um, which is, again, consistent with um, all of the New Testament about the Old Testament. I am in the Old Testament. I am included in history, and I am carrying the message of history. You see, Jesus, you know, if we were to listen to, I don't know, and I, I don't know, inaugural addresses are usually way too long um, here in our country. But um, if you listened to any inaugural address, and I did not go back and listen to them, I'm doing a lot of assuming here because I know the nature of our country and the nature of our politics. If you actually listen to an inaugural address by any president from any party for the last 250 whatever years of our existence, an inaugural message always emphasizes one thing, this person who has come into office is going to change something. I've got a new message. I've got a message of change. Jesus' inaugural message is very different because what he says is, I am not going to say change anything because the message I have, I am not only placing myself in history, I'm actually giving you the message of all of history. And it has never changed. And it has never wavered. It has always been the same. I am that message. And just like last week, go to the next slide. When he reads Isaiah um, 61, he says this. This is where we're going to kind of camp ourselves here for, for the rest of the time. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that blind will see, and that the oppressed will be set free. When Jesus says this, Remember last week we were at the water and the wine? Jesus always shows up in the place of need. We have it again. Jesus is saying that Jesus is the God who intervenes on behalf of those who can't help themselves. Jesus intervenes on behalf of those who are held captive by forces stronger than they could ever free themselves from. Jesus intervenes with those who need liberated. Jesus intervenes with those who are poor. And, and, and the poor here certainly can mean um, people who are poor, but it means much more than that. If it were people who were poor, I would actually, like, at a, at a certain socioeconomic level, um, and, and I think to a certain extent, those are the marginalized ones. Those are the ones who are helpless. Those are the ones who are in need. But I know one thing that I know that Jesus doesn't do, and he doesn't want me to do, is then I could spend the rest of the sermon trying to actually define who the poor are so that we can bring good news to those people <clears throat> Jesus says this in such a way that the poor, blessed are the poor in spirit from the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who are spiritually bankrupt. This is meant to be good news for you and me. And so often, even when we preach this, this becomes the mission of the church. That this is what we are supposed to do. And so we spend a three-point sermon to talk about those who are poor and those who are captive. And you know when we preach that sermon? The people who we describe as poor, the people we describe as captive, the people who we describe as blind, they're actually not sitting there. They're sitting out there and we're the ones who need 
need to go tell them. Jesus says this in our presence because we are the poor, we are the blind, and we are the captive. In fact, if you are not poor, and you are not blind, and you are not captive to something for more, I heard this this week, then you can walk out because this message isn't for you. That's the only people the Spirit comes upon. The people who are poor. People who are captive. And the people who are blind. We're all spiritually bankrupt. We're all spiritually in needing of someone to intervene. We are all in places of captivity. We all are blind. There isn't a person in this room that if you were to look back 5, 10, 15 years and know what you know now about something you thought you knew then, which guess what? It means we're blind right now because 5 or 10 years from now, we will all be, it'd probably even take 5 or 10 years for us to sit and figure out. We don't got, got it all figured out now. We all will go back in five to ten years and now and see how the Spirit came to us even though we were quite blind and still worked and still pursued and still did His work. And that the oppressed will be set free and go to the next slide. Actually, go back to, to the prior slide actually is missing a sentence and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. In the Old Testament, what was the year of the Lord's favor? It was this weird name. It was called Jubilee. And when Jesus sits down and says, today this was fulfilled in your hearing, he is saying, I am Jubilee. I'm Jubilee. Jubilee would happen on when? The Day of Atonement. What happened on the Day of Atonement? people's sins were forgiven. This is the year of the Lord's favor. This is the year that I have come to proclaim. We can look back at history. We can even look back at the history of Jesus' time. And, and the reality is, we might even question, well, how is this year's the Lord, Lord's favor? I mean, he lived another three years. He got crucified on a cross. Um, we may even say for ourselves, what do you mean you're proclaiming this is the, year's, the year of the Lord's favor? Because we know when I look at my future, it seems certain. It seems murky. Jesus made this promise a while back, but has, has the world really changed? We, we still go to war and we still fight with each other. Nation rises up against nation. Um, people don't get along. There's still sickness and there's disease. And Jesus actually came and he promised that he would, um, that he would set captives free, that he would um, come to the poor, he would come to the oppressed, he would come to the blind. And, and we look at our lives and we look at our world and we say, well, that hasn't happened. Well, where is the year of the Lord's favor? And I think we actually miss the point because we're so busy defining the poor and um, the oppressed and the blind just in physical terms. And what we end up doing is we see the Lord's promise and we look at our lives. We don't see that the Lord's promise has come true and we immediately say, well, I'm in a mess. And I guess the mess, because we've been trained, I guess, in, into believing uh, something about the promises, that if it isn't true in my life that this happens, the mess I am in is my fault. God's not with me. These promises 
are not true. And so then we look at our lives and they're messy and we come to the pastor's office and we want to hear what the pastor has to say. We want counseling. And when we counsel, we, we, we come we come to counseling because we think we're, we're messed up. We think that God is not with me. And the question that we ask is what, do, what action do I need to do to carry through so that these promises will become true for me? I mean, isn't that just the bulk of, 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 of evangelical Christianity? You actually come to church so that you can hear me say something so that you will be giving some actions for you that you can carry through so that the promises of God will be true for you. If the promises of God seem not true for you, then it must be your fault because we have too high a view of God um, to blame him. Some people blame him. That's, that's a, it's a common theme sometimes in culture too. But if you're really religious, you actually start blaming yourself and you come and you try to find out, what is it that I need to do, Pastor, so that the promises of God will be true? Well, that really makes the promises of God not promises of God at all, right? What kind of promise is it that is only good if I follow through on something? That's not a promise. That's a, that's a quid pro quo contract. In Luke 5, we get a hint of this. Because the promise for me and for you is true. It's been true. It's true now, and it will be true forever, and it comes true week after week in worship, day after day in our own lives, because when we look at what's holding us captive, when we look at the things um, that we are spiritually bankrupt over, when we look at the things where we are blind, in the next chapter, Jesus is going to come, and there's going to be a man. He's going to be let down uh, through the hole in the building, and Jesus is going to heal him. He needs healed. He's, He's wanted to be healed, and they couldn't get to Jesus so they cut a hole in the building and they drop him down and he what does he need what does he need to do what is what does he think he needs he he thinks he he needs healed he he thinks that he needs to walk again but Luke is going to tell us something very different because the first thing that Jesus says to him has nothing to do with his physical nature does it what does Jesus say to him the minute he walks down your sins are forgiven Because that's our biggest problem. And when Jesus says, I proclaim that the year of the Lord's favor is here, he is proclaiming that he has come to deal with your and I's biggest problem, which is the need for forgiveness of sins. Because it's our sins that hold us captive. It's our sins that bind us. It's our sins that blind us. And only he can forgive them. Sometimes I think in the enterprise of teaching and preaching, whether it's here, whether it's with our kids or whatever, when we open up our Bibles, it's like we start to believe that Jesus came to dangle the goods in front of us. Here you are. Here you are, Rover. He's dangling them in front of us waiting for us to act. He didn't come to dangle the goods. He came to deliver them and hand them to us. In the person and work of Christ, it's where the freedom comes. Freedom comes. It's why Paul was saying, Galatians 5 1, stand fast in the liberty which you've been given. And that word for stand fast is a warlike language. That this freedom, when it's dangled in front of you, you're a slave to whatever it is that you think will get you there. The war against freedom is always the war against the forgiveness of sins. You just take a simple statement like, what does God think of me 
when I sin. Then you give the correct theological answer to that. When I sin, you know what God thinks of me? He thinks of me exactly what he thinks of Jesus when he did not sin. That's what he thinks about when you and I sin. And to the extent that that bothers all of us, that means we're in chains. That means we're captive. That means we're not free. Because that is our holy hope. We have this fear of trusting the promises of God, which is what Jesus is doing here today. And you know, what a day, what a day and an age for this message of Jesus who's come to set captives free. You know, you, you want to know in those places in your life where you're captive, just go to your rage and go to your anxiety. And by the way, this has helped me to have a lot of compassion on people who maybe are filled with rage. Because underneath rage is someone who's captive to something. Underneath anxiety, underneath a loose tongue, underneath all sexual brokenness is someone other, uh, underneath uh, all addictions, um, whether you know, it be to a bottle or, or to a medication or whatever, under all of those things. And so what we come, we, we, we dangle something out in front of people, you know, for them to do in regards to that. But under all of that, under all of that is captivity. And we're so busy trying to pull the weed of whatever it is I just mentioned that we don't have. Jesus actually comes in compassion and love and says, I know that I'm coming to a world full of rage, so much rage that it's going to kill me. It's, it's, a, it's a world so much full of blindness that they can't see. And instead of putting on my hips and looking at them with rolling eyes and scoffing at them, I've actually come to deliver them goods. Because the reason they're angry, the reason they're addicted, is because they're held captive. And I have come to deliver the captive. In the year of our Lord, in the favorable year of the Lord, and the only way we will ever be delivered is through the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus is coming and he is saying, I'm on the loose. We'll pick this theme up in Lent. But one of the things that Jesus is saying here is he's come to a world that thinks they're in control of their life. Or in charge of their life. And Jesus only comes to those who are in need and out of control. So even the way we do Lent so often is it's the dangled way. We come to Lent and we say, I'm going to do that. I need to get more control of my tongue. I need to get more control of my family. I need to get more control of my weight. I need to get more control of watching TV or screen time or whatever. When the message of Jesus isn't to give you more control, he's asking you to give it all up. To give it up. He's asking you to die, not reform. The Holy Spirit comes upon him. The Comforter comes upon Jesus. And he comes upon you and I. And his ministry is one of profound comfort and profound compassion. It's why Jesus called the Holy Spirit the Comforter. Because he comes to people who are in bondage. He comes to people who are captive and not free. I read this this week. The more you and I talk about victory, the more we will never hear the word of Christ in our real places of pain. 
the more you and I incessantly talk about victory, we will never hear the word of Christ in our true places of pain. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit has not come for those who are in control. The Holy Spirit has come to those who are captive. And here's the lie. It's the lie of the evil one. It was the lie of the evil one that the Spirit of the Lord only comes to those who are not captive. Isn't that what we're kind of taught? You got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We've dangled. The Holy Spirit is dangled in front of us. But you know what? You're quenching the Holy Spirit because you're still held captive. You know how you quench the Holy Spirit? That way, by dangling him. That's how you quench the Spirit. The Spirit doesn't come to those who are no longer captive. You don't get an extra dose of the Holy Spirit by being less captive. In fact, what Jesus is saying here, and I've said this before, sometimes the way we treat the Holy Spirit and the way we present him, it's like he's worked himself out of a job. He comes to those who are poor. He comes to those who are blind. He comes to those who are captive. And if you are not poor, you are not blind, and you are not captive, you don't need the Holy Spirit because that's who he comes to. And so he comes to the poor, and to the blind, and to the captive. You know what we need? We need a fresh hookup. It's a bad term in our day. But you know what we need to hook up? The spirit with our need. The Spirit with our need. Jesus has come. And Jesus does something, and you can now go to this slide with the two scriptures um, on it um, there. I want to show you something Jesus did. Um, because if Jesus were alive today, and really religious people would come to him, and they would talk to him. They, would ex they were extremely mad about Jesus, and they're going to be extremely mad next week when uh, we're, we're done talking about this. But I'm going to show you something. Um, so this is Isaiah 61. I'm going to read it. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to release the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance on our God, and the day of vengeance of our God. This is what Jesus reads and quotes. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom by the, for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and he sits down. What's missing from Jesus? Jesus doesn't preach the whole counsel of God, does he? He picks and chooses what he wants out of the book of Isaiah, does he not? You better believe he does. What's missing? He doesn't say this is the day of the vengeance of our God. He sits down after he proclaims the year of the Lord's favor. Is he picking and choosing? Is he saying there's something complete and complex about the story of scripture that just isn't true right now as we speak well we know in john chapter 3 what does he say in that great verse that follows for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life for i did not come into the world to do what to condemn the world Jesus leaves off judgment because in the book of Acts, we are told that today is the day of salvation. Yes, in Scripture, judgment is coming. But that's not what day today is. Today is the day of salvation. Today 
is the day of good news. And the good news from Jesus here is Jesus saying, even in the midst of this text, as he proclaims the year of the Lord's favor, I did not come to bring judgment. I came to bear your judgment. That's why I came. I came to bear your judgment. And we rejoice when the Spirit comes over and over and over again, always to our place of need. Always. That's why you see the Spirit coming along in Romans. He comes and comforts us when we don't even know what to pray. He is always in our place of need, pointing to the finished work of Christ. Jesus, he's all we talk about here. Because he's all the Spirit ever talks about. And it's all of God and the Father ever talk about but Jesus because he's the one he's the one that the spirit of the Lord has come upon and he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and he sits down and he says, today, this was fulfilled in your hearing. Because not only have I played, placed myself in history, not only have I given, my, given the message of history, Jesus is saying, I am the goal of all of history. I am it. I'm it. And when I say something, it is accomplished. Thank you, Jesus. Indeed, there is power in that great name. We're going to sing that as um, people come to um, help lead us in worship. At the sound of your great name, I believe in the middle of that song, there is a line that says, your promises are true at the sound of your great name. His promises for me and for you are true. He did not come to dangle himself in front of you and play hide and seek from you. He is on the loose and his spirit has come upon us and is announcing over and over and over again that your sins are forgiven. And every time you hear that, you're set free the captives are set free. Let us stand and sing the sound of your great name.